Good morning, church. Thank you all for being here and joining us in a, in a new place to be able to, to join together for worship. Uh, some things change as we try to make progress in the church, and then some things never change. We filled up from the back to the front once again. <laughs> Uh, the difference now, though, is I can this week take the chairs out back there and move everybody toward the front. We're glad that you're here. We appreciate everybody coming and joining us for this service of worship. I am very thankful for everyone that's here, including the ones who sit out on the front as they came in. We are glad to have everyone in this service of worship, and, and we are looking forward to the, the future that God has planned for us and everything that we are going to try to accomplish. Barbara Honeycutt told me as she came in this morning, she had sat down, and she sat there a minute, and she said, Tommy, it's just occurred to me, I'm sitting on the wrong side. <laughs> and I said, well, Barbara, the Holy Spirit may not be able to find you over here. You may need to move over there. <clears throat> But, you know, we're trying new things as we come into this uh, t new time of in our church's history, and we thank you. I want to also take the time to, to thank everybody who did all of this, who set all of this up, who worked so hard. <clears throat> Can't tell you the number of hours that were put in, especially by Steve and by Robert Schnitz and by by, by uh, <clears throat> Brian James back there and, and just countless others that helped bring all this stuff in and set it up. It, uh, I am really grateful for everything that was done, and uh, I worked very hard. I moved a chair. And so I, it, it means a lot that, we've, uh, that we have so many people who have worked so hard in here. Today is not only the second Sunday of Pentecost, but it is Memorial Day weekend. It is a day that we remember those those people who sacrificed their lives to give us the, the freedom that we enjoy when we come into this place. Holy God, I thank you this morning. I thank you for all of those who have served and for all of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We get to be here and we get to be here unharassed because we are a people who benefit from what they have done for us. And so as we gather in this place today, O oh Lord, help us to be thankful people. Help us to be thankful people for the country that we have. Help us to be thankful for those who have paid the price to give us the opportunity to walk into this room, to sit together, and to not worry about who's going to show up to harass us. We pray, O oh God, that you will let your spirit descend upon us today. Birth within us all of the characteristics that, that make the church great and that have made our country great. Give us a spirit of oneness. Give us a spirit of unity. Give us a, a spirit of courage. Give us a spirit of hope. Give us a spirit of joy as we gather here today. Give us your spirit that we might be the people that you hope for us to be. And we might experience you in ways this morning that we may never have experienced you before. Come to us today, Lord Jesus, and bring us your grace, bring us your love, and help us to honor and respect you and those who lead. For it is in your name we offer our prayer. Amen. Let's stand and pass the peace to one another and speak to somebody you don't know. Don't just huddle with everybody you do know. Together, shall we? Oh God, you have been our help in ages past, and you are indeed our hope for years to come. You've been a steady hand when we have trembled. You've been a solid rock when the waters have rose about us. And we thank you for the many times that you've come to our aid, even in times when we did not even realize that we were in danger. And you have saved us for this very moment. You have brought us together in this place, the place that we've called the Fellowship Hall, which is now our sanctuary, as brothers and sisters in Christ who love you and want to express our love and devotion and to worship you. So Lord, help us to remember our past, but help us to realize that we are inseparably linked to all who have preceded us and also to all who come after us and that we have a duty to remember and a duty to be responsible towards future generations who come after us. 
So this morning on this Memorial Day weekend, we come to remember, we come to give thanks, to, we come to honor the memory of all who have joined in humanity's struggle on our behalf. Some are family, some are friends, others are completely unknown to us, but they are all important for their lives were given for us who are alive today. So we remember all the men and women who have died to protect our freedom and the freedom of others, and we are forever indebted for their great sacrifice. But even as we remember with gratitude the courage and strength of those who have served and died in our defense of freedom, we hold before you those who mourn for them. And as this day brings them memories of those they love, may it also bring consolation, may it bring comfort, give them your peace in their hearts. We thank you also, God, for our others of our own community of faith that have passed on since this time last year to their eternal reward. We were privileged to know them and to embrace them, and we remember them this day with a sense of gratitude, and in so thinking, we honor them, for surely just as we touched them with our hands, they touched our spirits and they left their mark upon our lives. They become a part of who we are be with all this morning who grieve the loss of loved ones. May they be comforted with the knowledge of your presence, your love, and hope of eternal life, and help us as a church family as we have opportunity to comfort them with the comfort that we ourselves have been comforted from you. We ask that this day of remembrance would be a day of peace. It would be a day of healing. Oh God, during this season of Pentecost, as we celebrate the coming of your Spirit, we pray that you would send your Spirit upon us. Come like a rushing wind that sweeps away all barriers that would divide us. Come like tongues of fire and set our hearts aflame that we might be more devoted to you. Come with love that binds us together as a church in, in mission and in ministry. So renew us, O oh God. Liberate us, abide in us, burn your righteousness into our hearts, make us bold in our, our witness for you, reconcile us to you and with one another, and guide us to discern your will and follow your ways. Make us into the church that you have called us to be, and may your spirit fill our worship, for we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture today comes from two passages. It's from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, and then also Acts chapter 2. And it would have helped if I hadn't clipped the wrong page together. I think that's the first mistake up. No, it's not. <laughs> After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If the head of the house loves peace, your peace will rest on that house. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for workers deserve their wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome to eat what is set before you, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. And from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly 
A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you hoping and praying that we will experience your spirit as we gather here. Some of us miss that spirit sometimes just because we're not watching for it. Sometimes we miss the power of your spirit because we know that it's there and we just don't want to follow it at that moment in our lives. We pray, O oh God, that we will be open to what you have to offer us today, that the power of that spirit and the wonder of your word would come and it would descend upon us in this place and that we would know beyond any shadow of a doubt, that we have not only been in the presence of the Spirit of God, but we have been called to serve in the name of that Spirit. Make it so today, O Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> there are a lot of good things that can be said about those of us who live on this earth, but one of the worst things that can be said about us is that we are very prone to miss out on, on greatness even when it is standing right in front of us. Let me give you an example of that. Most of us, most of the world have, have admired Queen Elizabeth for years and we all know who she is. We, we're all saddened when she finally passed from us. Very few people enjoyed the presence of the queen more than the village of Balmoral in Scotland. The queen spent most of her summers in Balmoral, and, and unlike where she went in other places in the country, she was so at home there that when she would go to Balmoral Castle, she would drive herself in her favorite vehicle, a 20-year-old Green Range Rover, and she would go into Balmoral and she'd walk around the streets and she'd go to the shops and she'd visit with the people and she would literally make herself at home there. One day she went into Balmoral and she went to her favorite tea and coffee shop and, and she ordered a cup of tea and so the young woman got the queen's tea for her. But then she's, when the queen started to pay, the teenage girl looked at her and said, I don't know if anyone's ever said this to you, but you look just like the queen. When she did, the queen looked at her and she smiled and she said, oh, that's a relief. And then she shook the girl's hand and she left. When she did, the shop owner came over to the girl and she said, why didn't you curtsy? And she said, why would I curtsy? And she said, that was the queen. And, and when she did, she said, that was the queen. She said, yes. She said, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Then she ran out the door and she went out to where the queen was getting into her Range Rover and she curtsied and she said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I didn't realize it was you. And the queen laughed and she said, that's all right, dear, sometimes I don't realize it's me either. <laughs> One of the great gifts of Pentecost is that it brought humanity the ability to discern the truth. When the Holy Spirit came to that upper room 2,000 years ago, the first thing that happened was 120 people understood the truth that Jesus had been trying to teach them for three years. They knew they had been living in the midst of greatness that entire time. They knew that they were being empowered to, to proclaim the message that, that they, they had that they had just experienced, that they were being called to proclaim that message to the people that were on the street. They knew that truth that had come to them could change everything, and they knew they had to go out and bring that message to life. They had to go out and preach it to the people that were there so everyone would be able to understand. And that miracle that had come to them had given those people, most of them illiterate, the ability to speak the languages of the people on the street so they could com communicate that message that had come. The gift of the Holy Spirit brought the gift of recognition to those people and it empowered those people to offer what they had recognized. However, 
let's not forget that every day of their lives wasn't as successful as that first day of Pentecost. And the reason it wasn't is because we humans have a tendency to to see and recognize greatness, but then we also have a tendency to turn and just walk away from what we have seen and experienced. And if you don't believe that can happen, just think about this passage of Scripture that I have just read to you from the Gospel of Luke because this passage is precisely what I am talking about this morning. It's a story about people who knew the truth and they chose to reject that truth. This story that I read is a great story, but if we want to fully understand it, then we have to kind of set the stage for it just a little bit. Luke 9.51 said, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. That meant he was determined to go to Jerusalem even though Jesus knew by this time that going to Jerusalem was going to mean suffering and it was going to mean death. But instead of seeing this trip as a burden, instead of seeing this trip just as something to be, to be afraid of or, or, or to... Or, to, to realize, feel like that it was just something that would be overwhelming, Jesus chose to do something very different. He chose to see this trip as an opportunity. He chose to turn this into a teachable moment, and he chose to turn it into a missionary journey, both for him and for his disciples. Jesus was doing the best he could to bring the kingdom of God as close to the people as was possible, which is why Jesus decided to send the 72 disciples into all the towns in that region. Up to this point, Jesus had been doing most of the ministry himself. He, Jesus would go into a town. He would preach the gospel. He would heal the sick. The disciples would go with him. They would help him all they could. But mostly what they were doing was they were learning from Jesus as they went on those trips. But now, in this case, Jesus was changing the gear, so to speak. He was changing the way that he was going to be doing things because Jesus knew his physical presence, his physical ministry on earth was about to come to a close, which meant if the gospel was going to be, be taken to the world, if the gospel was going to make a difference in the world, it was going to have to be done by his disciples. It was going to have to be done by what he had promised. It was going to be done by the church. So, not only did Jesus need to know that his disciples were capable of doing what he was calling them to do, but they needed to know that they were capable of doing it as well. He sent them in pairs to do ministry, to preach the word, and to, to be basically an advance team for Jesus. Uh, they were spreading the word that Jesus was on his way to their villages. Back in that day, when a great rabbi would go into a village, he would send his disciples ahead of time to let everybody know that he was coming, what day he was going to be there, and where he was going to be. It was the only form of advertising that they had back in that day. But what was different about Jesus was that Jesus was spreading the word that he was coming and he was actually going there to do the ministry that he was calling. He was asking his people to do that ministry. However, we need to remember something here. Jesus was a great rabbi, and he could do the ministry that he needed to have done. But Jesus was also a very controversial rabbi. Jesus was a radical revolutionary. He wasn't like anything that had ever come before. He made it his business to afflict the comfort, comfort the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. Boy, that was a hard sentence to get out. I didn't realize that until right then. He made it his business. I'm going to try that one more time, to afflict the comfortable and to come. Well, dang. You got it. Until this day, what Jesus was doing is not always a popular thing to do. So, when Jesus was coming to town, people wanted to know about it, and not everybody wanted to welcome him into town. Some people wanted to know that Jesus was coming because they wanted to stop him from coming to their town. They didn't want this radical rabbi to come to their part of the world to stir up trouble or to, to offer controversy. So 
Jesus was warning the people that he was coming so they could decide whether they were going to welcome him or whether they were going to reject him. Luke 10, 8 through 11. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come near. But if a town refuses to welcome you, go out into the streets and say, we wipe even the dust of your town from our feet as a warning to you. But know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Notice something here, folks. The message was exactly the same. Whatever choice they made, the kingdom of God had come near. What Jesus was saying to the people here is, whether you want it or not, the kingdom has come. God will, God's will is going to be done, and you can be part of that will, but it's your choice. You have to decide. You've got to decide whether you want to be part of what God is doing or not, and your decision is going to determine what your life and your future is going to look like. If you want to be part of the kingdom of heaven, it could start right here and right now. But you have to decide. We all have to decide. The kingdom of God has come close. But what Jesus was saying was, I won't force the kingdom of God on you. I won't force it on any village, and I won't force it in your heart. If you want to be part of the kingdom, you're the one who has to open the door. Do you get what Jesus is saying here? The most important step in the Christian life is hospitality. We have to be hospitable to God and to God's people. We have to remember that it's God who is calling us to, to not only follow him, but to serve him. Luke 10, 7, Jesus gave his disciples these instructions. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality. The disciples had to accept that hospitality just as others had to offer it. The truest sign of the people of God is hospitality. Are we going to make room for God in our lives or not? Are we going to make room for the people around us that need God in our lives? Let me put it another way. There's nothing inherently Christian about believing in God. Nothing at all. Lots of people believe in God. Those clowns who flew planes into the World Trade Center, those folks believed in God. There's a church in Oklahoma that's called the Patriot Church, and they have a cross on one side of their little sanctuary, and they have a gun rack on the other side with an AR-15 assault rifle in it, and they preach a message of faith and violence every Sunday morning, and they don't seem to understand that you can't do that and follow Jesus. Those people believe in God. That Looney Tune militia group that tried to kidnap the governor of, of uh, Michigan and, and hold her for ransom, those people believed in God. They called themselves a Christian militia. There's nothing inherently Christian about believing in God. In fact, there's nothing inherently Christian about believing in Jesus. The Bible says that even Satan believes in Jesus, but the last time I looked, Satan wasn't a Christian. There isn't anything that's overtly Christian about believing in God, about believing in Jesus. In fact, the people in this story who were, they were rejecting Jesus, they believed in Jesus. That's why they were rejecting him. They knew who he was. They knew what he had done. They knew the kind of ministry that he'd offered to the world, but they also knew he was a radical person. He was a controversial person. They knew that he welcomed people to his fold that most groups did not want to welcome. They knew he was saying things and doing things that didn't conform to the traditions that they had grown up with. And so the leaders of the towns went out to meet Jesus and his disciples and they made it very clear they weren't welcome there. Why? Because they believed in Jesus and they didn't like what he was saying. Do you get the point here, folks? Those people knew who Jesus was and they knew what he did. They knew he was great, but they didn't want him in their lives because they didn't want to accept this radical message that he was bringing. 
on that first day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, the disciples came bursting out of that upper room and, and they started telling the story of Jesus in the languages of the people of the street and over 3,000 people were baptized into the faith that day. It was a wonderful miracle, something that has seldom been seen in the 2,000 years that have come since. That was a tremendous day in the history of the church. It gave birth to the church itself. But what we miss sometimes when we read that passage of Scripture is that there were over 100,000 people who had come to visit Jerusalem to be part of the festival of Pentecost. 100,000 visitors came that day. Only 3,000 said yes to the story of Jesus. Most of those people didn't show hospitality to the story of Jesus at all. They were the ones who stood on the street and said, those people are just drunk, that's all. They were just like the people of some of those villages that Jesus went to and wanted to preach in. The kingdom of God came right to their doorstep, but some people absolutely refused to become part of what they were seeing. I was, when I was working on this message, a name of someone came to mind. It was an individual that I have known and loved for a very long time, Time. In fact, I've known this person for over 20 years. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to this person about Jesus. And, and more than one time, on more than one occasion, they've come close to giving their lives to Jesus. But coming close to the kingdom doesn't get there for you. It doesn't make anything different for you. The kingdom of God has come close to this person that came to mind over and over and over again. And they've recognized the truth over and over again. But coming close doesn't change your heart. It doesn't bring the gift of truth. I've tried for 20 years to try to bring that person to faith but they've gotten right to the edge and still never said yes. On the other hand, I ministered to a young woman for over 15 years, and, and unlike this guy, her life was an absolute total wreck. She had addiction issues. She had been in jail over and over. She had come close to the kingdom more than one time in her life, but she had never said yes to Jesus but three years ago. I got a letter from her. It was an old-fashioned letter that had been handwritten to me, and she was writing it from jail, and she said, I've been a mess long enough. I want to be baptized, and I'm going to change. I had heard that before, but I had hoped it was true. Lo and behold, when she got out of jail, she showed up here at the church and she made a profession of faith and she asked me to baptize her and I did. And after I baptized her, she went straight into rehab and that young woman has been sober and faithful for three years now. It made all of the difference in the world when she showed hospitality to the Holy Spirit when it came to her. It made all of the difference in the world when she said yes to welcoming Jesus to her life. There's an old saying, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Some people come close, but they never say yes. But if they do say yes, it can change everything. If a church will say yes to the guiding of the Holy Spirit, it can change everything. If, if the world will say yes to the guiding of the Holy Spirit, it can change everything. 3,000 people said yes to Jesus on that first Sunday of Pentecost, and it not only changed their lives, but it literally changed the world. Most of those 3,000 were not from Jerusalem. They were from other places. They, they spoke other languages. And, and when those people left Jerusalem, when they left that festival, they went back to their hometowns and they told the story of Jesus. And that story started changing people one soul at a time. And that story was so effective and so powerful, almost a half million people were following Jesus within 60 years of the day of Pentecost. The miracle of Pentecost did not just happen once. It happened over and over and over and over. Every time someone said yes and then told their story, the miracle of Pentecost happened again. Every village on the road to, to Jerusalem had a choice. They could welcome Jesus or they could reject him. 
They could see the coming of Jesus as a burden or they could see it as an opportunity to make all things new. That was the choice back then. It is still the choice today. Are we going to see the spiritual truth? Are we going to recognize it when it comes to us? Or are we going to close the door to the kingdom of God? That is the choice of Pentecost. And that choice is just as important today as it was 2,000 years ago. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, come to us today. Come to us and reveal yourself. Reveal your power. Reveal your strength. Help us to give thanks for those who have had the opportunity and they have chosen to follow you and they have chosen to make you part of their lives. And help us to pray for those who have not. Help us to, to take seriously what it means to try to embody the Holy Spirit to the world around us. Help us, O oh Lord, if you have come to this place needing to know you, help us to be the ones who, who will make the choice. Help us to be the ones who will pray, Lord Jesus, I want to welcome you into my life. I thank you for coming to me. I thank you for loving me even when I didn't love you. I thank you for believing in me even when all I did was believe in you. I ask you, O oh Lord, to help me to make you the Lord and Savior of my existence. Help me to believe that you are the one who can change everything. Come to us today, O oh Lord, and fill our hearts with your spirit and with your presence that we might know without, beyond a shadow of a doubt that when your spirit descends, it changes everything and it makes us one with you. Come, Lord Jesus, and make us ready for your presence. Amen. Thank you for coming today, folks, to this first inaugural service in this room. Let's be in prayer for the weeks and months that are ahead. Let us work diligently to support one another and let us be as hospitable as we know how to be, not just to those who visit with us, but to the Holy Spirit itself, because that Spirit changes everything. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen.